My name is Peter Bergen. I run the International Security Program here. Uh, thank you for coming this afternoon. Uh, it's really my pleasure to in, uh, introduce three uh, old friends of New America. Uh, one of them is one of my oldest friends, uh, <laughs> in fact, from a long time ago, uh, Andy Worthington, who's a filmmaker, journalist, and uh, wrote uh, the complete Guantanamo files and is arguably, I don't think arguably, is one of the world's leading experts on Guantanamo. In fact, we have three of the world's leading experts on Guantanamo in this room. It's hard to imagine uh, who, uh, a better panel. And then next to uh, Andy is Tom Wilner, who's a uh, well-known lawyer at um, Sherman and Sterling. Uh, Tom Wilner uh, represented a number of the Guantanamo detainees. He argued two U.S. Supreme Court decisions uh, that established the right uh, to the uh, to have of habeas corpus for the detainees and also established their right to counsel, two probably the most significant legal decisions uh, of the last uh, decade and a half. And uh, finally, Colonel Mo Davis, who is a professor at Howard University, who was, uh, who ran the commissions at Guantanamo for some period of time. He's a, a, a colonel with 25 years service. He's also obviously a lawyer. Um, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to these gentlemen. Uh, should we start with you, Andy? Or do you want to start with, how do you want to start? I think, I think I'm leading off. You're leading off, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, and thank you for having us again uh, at, at New America. It's, uh, I, I would say it's a pleasure to be here, but right. uh, I keep thinking every year will be the last time that uh, we reconvene, but uh, it just keeps going on and on. As, as I'm sure it, you wouldn't be here now if you didn't know that yesterday was the 13th anniversary of the first plane landing at Guantanamo and the men getting off the plane and beginning this chapter in our history that I keep thinking at some point I'm going to be on a panel we're going to be talking about this as a historical footnote rather than a continuing chapter you know in America's history so I, I think every year when I come here I'm optimistic that, that that's going to happen and it just seems we never quite get there so hopefully uh, this time I'll be right and next year it'll be a, a historical chapter it was interesting to me yesterday watching the uh, the march in, in France. You know, millions of people turned out to stand up to terrorism, to stand with the French people you know, when they had their equivalent of 9-11. It made me think back to our 9-11 when the world stood with us. When you know, throughout the world, everybody you know, rallied around America. And to look at the opportunity that we had and how we've squandered that opportunity is disappointing. And I think a large part of that uh, points to Guantanamo and the stain that it continues to, to represent. I guess the encouraging news is that Guantanamo is down to 127 detainees. Uh, when originally the total population was 779. So if you recall, you remember the statements, you know, these men are all the worst of the worst, the kind of people that'll chew through the hydraulic lines on the plane, mm -hmm. you know, just to kill Americans on the way to Guantanamo. So that group of the worst of the worst, uh, started with 779, is down to 127. And of that number, there are 59 of that group that have already been cleared uh, to be transferred out. So, you know, a group that the CIA, the FBI, Department of Justice, Department of Defense unanimously agree uh, didn't commit an offense, won't be charged, don't pose a threat, and we don't need to keep them. But they've been sitting there for, what, now five years uh, mm -hmm. since they were cleared for transfer at a cost of somewhere, depending on which estimates you look at, between a million and three million dollars per person per year to keep people in confinement that we say we don't need. So that leaves 68 uh, people that aren't in that to be transferred category. There's a small group that either have been prosecuted or will be prosecuted, and then another group of the ones that are in between. But that group of 68 represents uh, about 8.5% of the total number that ever went to Guantanamo. This group that we were told represented the worst of the worst, uh, they're about 8.5% that uh, we want to keep in confinement and potentially prosecute. So it was encouraging yesterday, if you watched the Sunday talk shows, there was a lot of attention devoted to Guantanamo. And you had, uh, and again, you know, I think there's kind of a cohort of people that for years have protested and rallied and said, you know, we need to close Guantanamo. But you had yesterday, you had the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Dempsey, you know, who on Fox News said, and I'll quote him so I don't get it wrong, it's in our national interest to close Guantanamo. It creates a psychological scar on our national values. Mm. 
So you, know, you always hear that, you know, we got to listen to the generals. Well, here is the highest ranking general saying that this is a stain on our country and we need to close Guantanamo. You had Cliff Sloan as well, uh, you know, who just recently stepped down uh, after leading the State Department effort to repatriate uh, as many of the clear detainees as possible. And I certainly, you know, kudos to him for, I think 29 men were transferred out last year, which was the biggest year yet. But he was on as well. And he said, you know, well over 90% of those who have been transferred uh, after going through this process, not only are not confirmed of engaging in wrongdoing, they're not even suspected of engaging in wrongdoing. Because you always hear the argument about, you know, we were, we were talking about this earlier. It's frustrating to me when you hear people like yesterday on television say, if you send these men out of Guantanamo, they're going to go back and, and, and re-engage in terrorism. It's like, re-engage? Hmm. Where's the evidence they ever engaged to begin with? Because if there's evidence that they were ever engaged to begin with, we would prosecute them. So these are people that we had no evidence they ever engaged to begin with. Uh, according to their statistics, about, what, 6.5% have re-engaged in, in some form. Um, and he went on to say, he said, my own personal view is that holding men for 12 or 13 years without charges, many of whom have been approved for transfer for almost half of that time, is deeply inconsistent with the kind of country that we want to be. So, I mean, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with that, that, uh, you know, this, this has gone on for far too long. Guantanamo never should have opened to begin with. You know, it was an effort to avoid the law. Our strength for 200 years was our belief in the law, and then after 9-11, uh, we went to Guantanamo in the belief we could avoid the law. And we've paid that price for 13 years now, and it's, it's time that it stopped. The few that are, are to be prosecuted, uh, there have been a total of six people in 13 years that have been convicted, tried, convicted, and sentenced in military commissions at Guantanamo. Um, you know, Hicks, Hamdan, and Cotter are three that I personally charged as when I was chief prosecutor. There's also al Balul Al-Khosi and Noor Uthman Muhammad. So we've completed a grand total of six trials in 13 years. Of those six, four of the six uh, were convicted of providing material support for terrorism, which the DC Circuit, you know, which is the most conservative, uh, most respected uh, of the federal appellate uh, circuits, held that material support for terrorism is not a legitimate law of war offense in the Hamdan case, and also they reaffirmed that in the al Balul case, and they dismissed the charges. So the six people that have been tried, convicted, and sentenced for the six uh, were tried and convicted and sentenced for an offense that we've now determined was not an offense. So in two of those cases, in Hamdan, and then on Friday, uh, in the case of, uh, of uh, Noor Uthman uh, Muhammad, uh, the charges have been dismissed. David Hicks, uh, currently has a petition, you know, he pled guilty to providing material support, he has a petition to set aside his conviction. So this second-rate process that we created at Guantanamo that was supposed to be swift and severe and secret, uh, we've completed six trials and two-thirds of those were convicted of an offense is not an offense. So it hadn't exactly been, you know, a sterling <coughs> success at, at, at Guantanamo. Um, I guess the one thing that's really significantly different than the last time we, we got together is in the interim, uh, we've had the torture report that's been made public. And it was, I'm certainly pleased that that uh, has, has taken place. I, I think my only concern is, I think many people look at that as an end point, that the objective was to get that report out into the public domain. But to me, it's a starting point, not an ending point. The question is, what do we do now? Because you know, we led the effort to bring the world on board with the Convention Against Torture, which President Reagan presented to the Senate for ratification. And when he did, he sent a letter saying, the core provisions of the convention establish a regime for international cooperation in the criminal prosecution of torturers relying on universal jurisdiction. Each state party is required to either prosecute torturers who are found in its territory or to extradite them to other countries for prosecution. So, to me, it's a question of who do you side with? Do you side with Ronald Reagan or with Dick Cheney hmm. when it comes to torture? And I think Reagan had the right uh, view when he submitted this. And this is back in the day, and it was hard to recall in Washington a time when things were done on a bipartisan basis. But back in 1988, when President Reagan sent the Convention Against Torture to the Senate, it was approved overwhelmingly because we all believed in that notion that people that commit torture should be held accountable 
for their conduct. So to me, the question now is the reports out there, we've acknowledged, whether it's President Obama or John McCain, both sides of the aisle have acknowledged that we tortured some folks. And the question is, what do we do now? And doing nothing is not the right answer. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Andy. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, good to see you here. Um, Mo and Tom and I used to joke that we were coming here every, every year. So last year, we actually took a year off. Um, I think partly because we were tired, but also because there were signs of progress last year. And there hadn't been for, the, for several years before that. Um, I certainly feel more optimistic about, um, about this long-standing stain on American justice being brought to an end than I have for many years. But, um, I, but I would say that, that you know, our happiness is, only, um, is dependent on, on, on seeing action. So every time somebody is released, we're then waiting for there to be further action because we've seen so often, for a variety of reasons, the whole process hitting a brick wall. Um, Mo gave you a, a lot of figures there about, about who's still at Guantanamo and uh, you know, it, is, it is very heartening that uh, 28 men have been released in the last year, that there are 127 men still held and that 59 of those have been approved for transfer out of the prison. The majority of those were people who, who were approved for release by the uh, Guantanamo Review Task Force, a high-level interagency task force that President Obama established shortly after taking office in 2009. And as Mo said, it's five years at least since those men were told that the US didn't want to hold them. Some were told during the, during the year in 2009, so it's up to six years. Uh, the, and you know, 52 of these 59 men are, are from Yemen. And the stumbling block has been that across the entire United States establishment, there's an extreme reluctance, in fact, a refusal, I would say, to contemplate releasing people back to Yemen because of the security situation in that country. Um, that may be, um, I think, when I examine that, that seems to me that although I understand the, the worries about the security si situation, it seems very extreme to me that um, that's a blanket ban on everybody from that country. But at least it's been addressed in recent months and the administration has begun to find new homes for some of these men from Yemen who, uh, who they don't want to send home. But it's going to be an uphill struggle with 52 Yemenis approved for, for transferring Guantanamo to find other countries. I'm presuming that a lot of work is being done behind the scenes. We certainly hear some of that in the media, um, and, and I very much hope that those things are continuing. The seven other men of a particular interest to me is that one of those men is Shaka Arma, the last British resident in the prison. Um, and in the last few months, I've been involved in a campaign in the UK called We Stand With Shaka um, to try and get him released. Um, I won't talk too much about that because this is a campaign particularly focused not on the United States, but on David Cameron, our Prime Minister, trying to persuade him to say to President Obama that it's extremely important that this man, a legal British resident, is returned to the UK. What's interesting about his story is that this, this person, Shaka Arma, who's a Saudi national, um, has indefinite leave to remain in the UK, has a British wife and four British children, is that he is one of, if not the most outspoken critic internally of the, uh, of the entire detention system, lawless detention system set up after 9-11. From the moment that he was seized in Afghanistan in 2000, late in 2001, where he says, and no one has provided credible evidence to the alternative, that he had gone on to pursue humanitarian aid. He has fought for the rights of the prisoners. He, from the beginning, said, you can't treat us like this. Where are our rights? He understood that they had been stripped of their rights entirely. And he has fought uh, against um, against the unfair detention system, and he has been punished regularly for that. Um, so he knows personally about his own abuse. He knows about the torture and abuse of others. Um, but we, we presume in the UK that he's still held because both of the security services on both sides of the Atlantic uh, are saying that they'd rather keep him than have him released to, to tell stories that, are, frankly, are only going to embarrass both the governments. Both of our governments have proved very good at keeping accountability out of the courtrooms. So Shaka Arma is one of these people. Um, as we were hearing, you know, if we're going to go ahead, and I hope that we're going to see, continue to see swift action on, on releasing the men that the US said it doesn't want to hold, we are left with this group of 68 men, um, about 10 of whom are, are facing or have faced trials, leaving 58 men who the task force um, said were too dangerous to release, um, but also said that um, the reason 
that there was not sufficient evidence to put them on trial. Now, you know, that, that should always be shocking. And I think it's shocking that as a result of that report, in, in the spring of 2011, President Obama issued an executive order specifically authorizing the detention of 48 men that the task force had said were too dangerous to release, but insufficient evidence existed to put them on trial. Because it enshrined this notion that um, however it came about, it was justifiable to say, uh, we've got a kind of terrible evidence problem here, but, um, but you have to trust us. We have to, we have to break our rules and hold these people. And it was the moment that President Obama himself did this, rather than inheriting everything from President Bush, as he mostly did. And there is, frankly, no justification for, for trying to enshrine that notion. That's a very, very dangerous flight from the, the basis of detaining people. Um, reinforcing what had initially happened with the Bush administration. And, uh, and the problem with the so-called evidence is that when it's examined, it's discovered that a large amount of this information came from the prisoners themselves or from their fellow prisoners being interrogated and talking about each other. There were photo albums that were shown everywhere in the detention centers in the war on terror, including Guantanamo, of other prisoners, and people were persuaded in various means to say that they knew these people and that they knew stories about them. In some places that we know about, obviously, people were tortured. They were subject to other forms of abuse. There were people who were bribed. They were given, they were given treats if they would tell stories, and there are prisoners who have spoken about that happening. Some of them haven't spoken about that because they were people who were pushed because they had mental health issues. There are other prisoners who simply while not being destructively broken by what happened to them, say that they simply gave up on the ability to resist. And at some point, they went into the interrogation room where they were taken every day and said, OK, OK, what do you want? I'll tell you whatever you want to hear. And I know personally of some stories of people who, who everything they said was a pack of lies. But if you look at the files, you will see that these things are put down as though there is some degree of reliability to it. And the, and the problem is that once you start to analyze it in depth, very little in, the, in these files is reliable. Um, so in recognition of this, I think, to some extent, what happened, well, when President Obama designated these 48 men for indefinite detention in the spring of 2011, he was aware that that was going to cause criticism from people who, who respected the law and human rights. So he said there will be a review process to, for us to, to, to look at the cases of these men to see whether, whether we think they continue to pose a threat. And that review process didn't actually begin until the fall of 2013. Um, and it is moving slowly. It is intended to review the cases of all of these indefinitely detained prisoners and the majority of the men who were initially designated for prosecution, in large part because of the problems with the military commissions that Mo has talked about. So, in the last year or so, there have been nine of these periodic reviews, which, are, which, co which is representatives from all the major departments and agencies here in Washington, looking at the cases of these men as they make a case for saying, you know, why they do not constitute a threat, how they want to rebuild their lives. They're given military representatives at Guantanamo, who, as far as I can see, are, very, uh, are quite closely representing them, actually, trying to help get their story across to these representatives of the administration that they do not pose a threat. And we've had nine of those reviews, and in six of those cases, um, the prisoners have been um, approved for release. Uh, two of those men have been freed in recent months. One man went back to Kuwait and another to Saudi Arabia. The four others who've been cleared haven't because they're Yemeni, so they're part of the whole issue that the entire US establishment has with people from Yemen. But this is progress, and if these, um, if these reviews continue, then I think, it's, I think we are very clearly going to see that a very high level review pr process is establishing that the, of these 68 men, it is, not, it is not appropriate to say that they are, they are all so dangerous that they must continue to be indefinitely detained or put on trial. It's a very slow process, I think, and I'd love to see it happen a lot quicker. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's the single most important thing that people who are concerned about the injustice of Guantanamo should support. I think it's important not to be swayed by the notions that, um, that, that you, can, you can accept the, the, the purported dangerousness of people when the evidentiary basis is so shallow, so tainted, so broken. Um, so that's where we're at. The, the thing that will happen if, 
if the prisoners approved for release are released, and we reach this point where we've got 68 men, or less than that, is that I believe at that point the president will be able to uh, make the case more strongly than he has been able to to date to Congress that, that it's ruinously expensive to continue Guantanamo, to make the case as he always has done about how fundamentally wrong Guantanamo is on every basis, and to move those men to the United States mainland. Now, there are many, ma many lawyers, many people involved in human rights who are extremely concerned that this would then enshrine the Guantanamo system on the US mainland. Um, I have to say that it seems to me there is no evidence of, um, of, of, of uh, the right of the government in this country to hold people without charge or trial on the US mainland, and that that would be the subject swiftly of, of uh, robust legal challenges. Um, I don't think the intention would be sustainable um, if anybody wanted to back it of holding people without charge or trial on the US mainland. They would have to be put on trial um, or they would have to be released. But, you know, we, we will continue, I imagine, amongst various groups to argue about that. But I think this is, this is obviously the only way that Guantanamo can be closed, is for as many people as possible to be released from there, the rest to be brought to the US mainland for trials and for the, their disposition in the ways that we can argue about how that would happen. But um, this is how I see the progress. And as I say, this is, this is I'm more optimistic about things than, than I have been for some years. And it, and it remains an issue of great importance to me as a, as a human rights issue. But you know, Guantanamo is an international story. What the United States did after 9-11 um, resonated internationally. I'm here as a British person, not because, you know, because I want to take on what America did, but because these issues are so profoundly important because America was founded on, uh, on the basis of the rule of law. And Guantanamo is and always has been a legal, moral, and ethical abomination. And every day that it remains open, it ought to be a source of profound shame to anybody who respects the rule of law and justice and fairness. Um, so, you know, I hope that we don't have to keep doing this every year and that this will be the year that we really, really do see progress. And that those of us who care can do whatever we can to encourage the Obama administration to, to keep moving towards the president fulfilling that promise he made on his second day in office to close Guantanamo. Thank you. Thank you Andy. Tom. Well, let me, let me say, I, I never know what I'm going to say until I hear Mo and Andy, and they're terrific. And then I wonder, well, what further can you say? Um, but I'd like to start off, I, I'd like to recognize Congressman Jim Moran, who joined us a few years ago up here, and who was one of the great congressmen uh, who supported closing Guantanamo from the beginning and fought for it. And I, I think in the last elections in Congress, uh, the great loss was not just that the Republicans won the Senate, but that uh, two great legislatures, legislators, Jim Moran and Carl Levin, retired because they were the great supporters throughout. So we miss you. I hope we can get together otherwise and strategize. I, um, I wanted to say, you know, I want to be a little bit more reflective on some things. In the, uh, what happened in Paris and talking with people about it uh, has made me realize one of the problems we face in dealing with Guantanamo and torture. Um, I have a sense sometimes when I speak that I'm speaking within an echo chamber, that the people who listen are the people who agree already. And, uh, and we haven't reached beyond that to the great mass of the American public about these issues. We've got to do a better job about it. I'm shocked that um, I've seen polls that most Americans um, believe maybe the torture was okay that maybe we need it. And, and I realized thinking about it after Paris and talking with some other people that there's a question people have that we haven't addressed, whether our Western democratic values can effectively deal with Islamic terrorism. Um, is it, are they effective? Can you, can you really forego torture? Do you need to have uh, detention based on suspicion rather than evidence. Now, people really are questioning that, and, and unfortunately, I, I don't think we have addressed it convincingly. I think it's important to, my basic belief, and based on the facts, is, is, is General Dempsey said, uh, that you know, it's in our national interest to close Guantanamo, that 
when the United States tortures, it, it condones torture throughout the world. It makes the world worse, but it hurts us. You know, we, we've got a, you mentioned Ronald Reagan on the, when he presented uh, the Convention on Torture for Ratification of the U.S. and our, our act. Reagan also said some other things. When he nominated the first Bush, there's so many Bushes now, you don't know which one. When he <laughs> nominated the first Bush to be uh, president, he made a great statement. He said, you know, uh, our greatest strength derives not from our wealth or our military power, but from our values, our principles. The United States' ability uh, to have effect around the world, to make the world a better place, depends on our adherence to our principles. Our, uh, what Diane St Feinstein is now fighting a fight on the torture report, and people are disagreeing with her. You know, we've, we've got to make the case that torture hurts us. And, and it's a fairly easy case on the facts, I think. You know, um, it, I mean, I've interviewed lots and lots of uh, interrogators, and they all say there's no doubt that uh, rapport building is much more effective then if you torture people, yes, you get information. You don't know if it's reliable. And, uh, and the only, but it, rapport building is much better for getting reliable information you can count on. Now, people say well, there might be a justification in, a, in an exigent situation, the ticking time bomb, but that you never, you know, you, you rarely see that. You never see it. You don't, you don't, let me see. Every one of my clients at Guantanamo in I-12 was tortured. Every one of them. There was no exigent situation. They had been there for years. So what do you do? Do you torture thousands and thousands and thousands of people to get one piece of information which, which may or may not be relevant when you could do rapport building? It makes no sense, and it hurts us around the world. Abu Ghraib is continuing to hurt us. Guantanamo hurts us. Andy talked about what we're doing in well, another issue that you know, come into it, is I found for the last 13 years that so much of this debate, and torture and others, is based on concepts or false statements or false facts or false assumptions rather than digging in and seeing what are the actual facts. You know, when I, I brought a case in May 2000, May 1, 2002, just for hearings for the people in Guantanamo, at that time we were told that everyone down there was the worst of the worst. And I, you know, I met some of the families of the Kuwaitis, and I said, these kids were actually you know, good kids who had been involved in charity. I said, shouldn't they at least have a hearing so we get to the actual facts? Well, I, you know, I soon, soon learned through deep throats in the intelligence community, listen, by and large, we got a lot of the wrong guys. Every Arab found down there turned in for a bounty was sent to Guantanamo. A lot of these guys, most of them were either low, low level people who had gone down to shoot a gun or were just simply innocent people. But, but we kept debating in the press, these are bad guys, you can't let bad guys go, so you can't get uh, people have a hearing. You know, today we are, as Andy said, we're one of the basics for our law, coming back to the Magna Carta which we got from you guys, by the way. Thank you very much. So you have a right to 800th be here. 800th anniversary this year. 800th so. anniversary. <laughs> but was the concept that you can't hold people arbitrarily, that they have a right to go before an independent judicial authority to see whether there's a law they're supposed to violate it and there's evidence that will allow them to be held. What we're saying for people, for the 65 people who have not been cleared, who are still at Guantanamo, um, the government makes this statement that they're too dangerous to release, but the evidence against them can't be presented. Let me tell you, that's, as Andy was saying, that's very, very misleading. The public gets the view oh, that the government knows that these are really dangerous people. There's something there, but you know, there's some sort of evidence that might have been through torture, so they can't do it. That's not the case. It's a mis mischaracterization of who those people are. I've looked at the evidence a lot of of two of the people, because I'm not allowed to see others. Andy, by the way, because the WikiLeaks information is out, has looked at them, and what you find is that these are people who, as he said, there will be allegations against them made by another detainee. 
If you look at it, you can see that those other detainees making the allegations are, are proven to be liars in other cases, but there is this vague suspicion. So people say, well, is it a bank? Well, maybe they did something. How can we let them go? It's not that they've made a determination they're too dangerous. It's just, that's a mischaracterization. It's a vague suspicion. We don't hold people. We have never held people based on pure suspicion. You, you either have evidence against them and can try them or you throw them out of court. I mean, the evidence against these people would never stand up in a court of law. It's, it's wrong. Does, if we start holding people based on suspicion, we could clear out the streets in this country. And it's more dangerous when they are people who don't have a voice in the United States or the minority. I mean, what do we, do we start holding blacks again based on suspicion but not, not waspy white people? You know, we don't do that. It's so wrong. And we've got to explain to people, you know, how this really is wrong. And let me just say one more fact about it, just to put it in, in context. Most of the people in Guantanamo were picked up in the months after 9-11 in and around Afghanistan. Um, it was really recognized pretty quickly that we didn't get the leaders. I mean, everybody knows that. They got away. So the people we got, it became recognized, were at most low-level people, and as I said, a lot of innocent people down there. Every Arab was turned in. Interestingly, by June of 2004, the New York Times had an article, which I really thought was a seminal article, said, we talked to all security experts in the United States and Europe, and they recognized that there's nobody significant. There's no significant threats down there. It was only after that that the, that the Bush administration transferred in some of these high, so-called high-value detainees from black sites. But most of these 65 people who are still down there are the people who were there from the beginning, who we recognized as long ago in 2004 were not significant threats, and yet they're still there. We've got to dig into the facts, really deal with these issues, and, and close the damn place. It's disgraceful. And the president, I don't want to criticize him as I always do because he's doing something and I want him to go further. But you know, I don't want to give him too much credit for suddenly getting, uh, what is it, 30 people out after all these years. We've got to really devote the resources and have the political courage to get this place closed, try the few people who you think should be tried, and get the others home. Um, as Cliff Sloan did say in one of his uh, recent speeches, that one of the top security experts for another country, not a European country, said to him, the most important thing we could do to combat terrorism is to close Guantanamo. We've got to get it done. Thank you, gentlemen. Point of information, uh, Tom. So when you said your client, dozen of your clients were tortured, what, what happened to them as a general? Um, oh, it was still so. Uh, various things. Um, each of them were badly beaten up. Uh, when they were detained? or When they were detained. In the process or? In almost immediately from the time that they were taken into custody. And it was shocking to me, one of them, Fauzi al his father had fought with, um, uh, against, in, in the first uh, Kuwait war, when it was invaded by Iraq, he had been an underground fighter uh, for the United States and against Saddam Hussein. And Fauzi was a little kid, he loved the United States. He said he was so happy when he was turned into the United States. From the first day, he was put in something, hung by his wrists from the floor and beaten. Uh, he said I, he just couldn't believe it. Each of them told stories like that. Others were prodded with uh, electrodes. Some were sort of sexually molested. Was this in Afghanistan? In Pakistan? I mean, on in the way out? In work? Afghanistan, in Afghanistan and Pakistan, s some more abuse in, Guantan in Guantanamo, not as severe physical abuse. I, you work at Sherman and Sterling, which is a well-known white shoe law firm, right? Yes. Uh, what is the attitude of your partners about the work you do? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> I, I ran into considerable difficulty when I took on this work originally. Sherman and Sterling is not only a white firm, it's a financial firm uh, in uh, many friends in Wall Street, many who were killed in 9-11. Yeah. So there was some, uh, I had some problems taking this on. Is that dissipated? 
Yes, it's dissipated. I, I think that initially it was a tremendous problem because Guant there was focus on Guantanamo. Yeah. Now, frankly, in the national press, there's so little focus of it, it doesn't present them with problems. Now, let, let me say there were some people, and I, you know, I've always said this, interestingly, people my age were very supportive hmm. because they grew up in a time when we had to fight for causes we considered important. I think the younger people had got into the capitalist financial stage when making money is the purpose of law. When I grew up, you know, I think all of us thought of lawyers not only as, in, as law, not only a way to make money, but a way that you were the guardians of a rule of law which allowed commerce and allowed free speech and everything else. So, Colonel Davis, so you were the chief prosecutor. Which years were you chief prosecutor? From September 2005 to October 2007. What are your, um, I mean, have you had any, I mean, obviously you're a huge critic and uh, of, the, of Guantanamo. What of your former colleagues, do they understand uh, the positions you've taken or are they, were they unhappy about it or? I think it's a mixed bag. I think, uh, I'd say a majority are very supportive. Yeah. And some that aren't. I, mean, I think there's some that kind of look at, you know, these you know, they drank the Kool-Aid and bought the argument these guys are the worst of the worst and any rights they get are, you know, through charity and grace and not through, you know, the rule of law. But I think that's been the exception and not the rule. I mean, I've had a lot of support from the intelligence community, from the military community. I mean, if you look at the people that fought against ever opening Guantanamo, ever starting the military commissions, ever using torture, it was the uniformed services. And then they were excluded from the conversation. You had the political appointees, the John Hughes and the David Addingtons, and you know that made the decisions and you know, put us on this path. My impression is, uh, I haven't read the entire CIA report, but my impression that one of the takeaways from the report is that the, there was an early discussion of having the Bureau of Prisons be involved, which would have obviated this whole thing. Is that correct? Yes. Um, you know, you mentioned Paris, Tom. Uh, French magistrates, my impression is, can hold you for two or even three years without charge on a s suspicion of terrorism, right? And, and, what's, and how long can you be held in the UK? Is it 14 or 28? Or I'm not sure where they ended that, that but it was, Someone, you know, yeah. it was so, but expanding the number of So weeks. in France, a magistrate can throw you in jail for two or three years. I mean, not 13 years, but I mean, it, we're not alone in this. I mean, I, I think there are other countries that, Western countries, which have a... You know, but interestingly, even in a country like Israel, which faces the constant threat of, of terrorism, you need to be brought before a judge within 10 days, <coughs> and there needs to be evidence presented. Right. So, you know, it, would, it took us to win really more than, the, you know, two and a half years, three years to win the Rasul case before they could even get any sort of hearing. And right. then after that, it was another four years after So that. in France, at least you're going to see a magistrate, even though he, you do. he or she might throw you in jail. You're still going to have some kind of due process. A, a review. A review. Can, can just yeah. inject one thing? You know, th after the detainees won the right to habeas and the cases went before the federal courts, the government's argument has always been that under the law of war, we have the right to detain the enemy for the duration of the conflict. And the courts have accepted that argument. Well, the conflict that the government cited is the war in Afghanistan, which, which the president officially ended a couple of days ago. December 31st. Right, so either the basis, the legal justification that we've used for the last 13 years to justify <laughs> detention under the law of war doesn't exist anymore. So we either have to create a new legal fiction. We have tied ourselves in a huge pretzel on this one, right? I mean, because it's either, they're either prisoners of war, in which case they should be released as of now, or they're common criminals, in which case they shouldn't have gone into what it was a prisoner of war detention camp. Right, so we're, we're again, we're setting a precedent, you know, in our conduct, you know, from this point forward on setting a legal basis, a legal justification to detain people outside the law of war and outside the criminal justice process. Now, the Yemenis, um, I mean, which countries in your estimation, because I mean, I think there is a reasonable argument to say, hey, you know, Yemen, it's unstable. People have escaped from prisons multiple times. Um, in fact, the leadership of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, I think, were some of them came out of a Yemeni prison. So. Uh, other countries like Uruguay or which countries could they go to other countries, presumably, you know, the negotiations going on. Do you have a sense, Andy? Well, I mean, first of all, I'd like to say that, it, that when you've had a high level review process, which has established that people aren't a sufficient threat to carry oh, right. on holding. So, yeah, they're not even going to prison. <laughs> but you then don't send them home because you're saying that that 
there's another, it's like there's another airlock. It's like you can never get out of the prison because I think they should be sending people home on the basis that, you know, that there's, that I can understand they, they're going to have worries if there appears to be, you know, um, terrorist sympathies that are very obvious in their family background, for example. But I think the blanket ban, to me, seems completely unacceptable. But I mean, is there, as a political matter, it might be easier to release them to Uruguay and then eventually they get back to you. I mean, is there a, what, yeah. what is the way to go? Well, uh, you know, I think you may be right, Peter, in the sense that, you know, that people will be released to countries and that when the dust settles in a few years, maybe arrangements will be made <coughs> for people to move. I don't know which countries they are. I mean, clearly, you know, maybe Cliff Sloan uh, retired because he has so many air miles. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's been he's been everywhere talking to everybody. Which, which are the countries and, that um, have been accepting the prisoners of late? Well, I mean, we had Kazakhstan was the, the last country, so uh, you know, I don't know whether that means that there are other places in Central Asia. I think Central and South America, you know, there are there are places that are looking <laughs> interesting. Estonia right. is apparently taking huh. well, one of people. The, I think one of the myths is that there aren't countries willing to t take people. Um, I, I found about. Four years ago, um, I found a country in my other normal life, and I went into, at that time, Dan Freed was in charge mm -hmm. of getting people. And Dan said to me, Tom, the problem isn't the countries. I've got a lot of countries. It's getting the orders from the White House to transfer them mm -hmm. there. Now, Cliff Sloan, when he just retired, he said, we have a lot of countries who will take them. That's and he said, the Pope has been terrific in doing that. The Pope has been terrific. The Pope has been terrific encouraging mm -hmm. countries to do it. Um, I'm tempted to say he's a heck of a pope, but um, yeah. yeah, but he really is. <laughs> and he, he, but anyway, he um, Latin American countries and other Central Europe, uh, Central Asian countries are going to. And you know, one of the problems you go to, you know, it's easy to find countries which are uh, uh, not democracies, <laughs> which will, uh, you know, take them. But there are countries who will take them. The problem is the United States won't take them now. I mean, that's, that's just. But I guess my next question, which is if, he, if we're going to really close Guantanamo by the end of 2016, which I'm sure is the president's plan, I mean, and, and Congressman Moran is here, and, and I mean, there is a sort of huge not in my backyard type, which, where could they conceivably go in the United States where there wouldn't be, I mean, is it Terre Haute? Is it, I, I don't know what it is. I mean, what? I believe in, in the last Congress, it was quite clear that the uh, uh, Senate Armed Services Committee would have voted to take them to the United States as part of this. And um, both the leadership and the Republican ranking uh, member would have done that. Um, the problem was in the House, and I think that's the next thing to work on. Yeah. Uh, Tom's exactly right. You know, the one country that's adamantly refused to take any detainees is us. Right. which really hurts when you go to other countries and say, you know, would you help yep. us out of this problem that we created? You know, we're not going to help ourselves. We'd like for you to help us. But, you know, Bermuda took four. Palau took six. You'd think, you know, we're the home of the brave, and we can't be as brave as Bermuda. Well, now there's been a, there's been a huge controlled experiment on the question of trying people in Al-Qaeda, relatively high-ranking Abu Hamza just got a life sentence, uh, mm -hmm. not that he was in Al-Qaeda, but sort of in the support yep. network. Uh, and there aren't people demonstrating in the streets in New York. New York, yep. downtown New York, didn't close down when these trials have happened. All the arguments, the KSM trial would be there would be attacks. The downtown New York would be in lockdown because you couldn't drive around it, and it, and it didn't happen. Now, KSM, of course, still hasn't been on trial. He's been in U.S. custody for, what, 12 years now? Mm -hmm. So, the I mean, one of the questions for this, like, uh, let's take a poll here. When do you think he will actually go on trial? 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018. I don't know, Peter, because I think what we're aiming for is the, is the point at which uh, all the men who haven't been approved for release are moved to the US mainland. Yeah. I would say to a military prison, I would say that it's feasible that we will reach the position where it is argued that those men, the small number of them, need to be put in federal courts, yeah. as, was, as was intended in 2009 and should have happened. Yeah. I don't know whether that will happen. I mean, these are, they, they, it's very speculative. Yeah, so, so if KSM got transferred to the United States, it's conceivable that he would get transferred into military custody and face a yes, military commission rather, rather than a federal trial. Well, but except yeah. that the military commissions don't work. Right, well, that's, <laughs> why, that's, well, no, why, that's, that's, that's why I'm that's asking point. this. I w I'd just like an estimate from you about the year that he will go on trial. I think if I was betting, I would say 2016 and in federal court. Well, to, to make your point, though, Peter, when KSM was withdrawn from the criminal justice system and they said they're going to try him by uh, military commission, 
all the lawyers I know who were defending these guys who were going to be charged were praying it wouldn't be in federal court and they could have it in a military commission mm -hmm. because they could bollocks up the system forever. And they knew that. I mean, there was, it was, so, so Lindsey Graham was saying, we need to try these people before military commissions. That's the way to do it. With the assumption this was a quick and easy way, all the defense lawyers said, this is just what we want. And that's what's yeah. happened. Yeah. When oh. I was chief prosecutor is when President, you know, President Bush had to make a decision on what to do with the black sites and the people that were being detained there. And there was a debate whether to go the DOJ Bureau of Prisons route or the military the Guantanamo Military Commission's route. And the president made the decision to go the military commission route. So in September of 2006 is when the plane landed at Guantanamo. And we didn't know how many people would be getting off the plane that day, but there were 14. Since then, that was September of 2006. Since then, there's been one person that's been tried, convicted, and sentenced, and the case is over and done. Who is that? Ahmed Galani. And where was that? Right. That was in New York in federal <laughs> court. All right. So he's the yeah. only one. The other 13 men that got off the airplane that day with him are still floundering in the system at Guantanamo. You've had, in addition, you mentioned Abu Hamza. Abu Hamza, it was 21 months ago that he was extradited from the UK to the US. And in 21 months, he's been prosecuted, convicted, and sentenced. You had Abu Ghaith. Yeah, you know, it's pretty high, honest. pretty high you know, visibility case. Uh, Abu Qatala, federal court. So our federal courts work extraordinarily well. Our prison system, you know, we've had no, you know, all these guys have been successfully held, prosecuted, and the world keeps turning. But we keep spinning our wheels at Guantanamo in this process that over and over and over has failed. Okay, can I just uh, yeah. intrude on one more point? There? So. Um, Eric Holder said, I want to try KSM in the federal courts in New York. And there was opposition, and the president backed down, and it's gotten into this mess. And we should say, uh, Greg Craig, when he, the very beginning, when he was counsel of the president, recognized one of the big things is what Mo said. How can you ask other countries to take these detainees if you won't take them yourselves? Greg Craig had a plan to move some of the Uyghurs who were you know, uh, who the Bush administration said were captured by mistake <laughs> from Guantanamo, right. to move one to a, ver a community in northern Virginia, yeah. and uh, where there was a Uyghur community. Guy was absolutely innocent. Was it Frank Wolf? Who Frank Wolf, uh, uh, who, who I am not sorry retired, um, <laughs> stood up and said, you cannot do this, this is a terrible thing, and Obama backed down. Rather yeah. than saying, what are you talking about? Here's an innocent man who the people have, you know, mm. the Bush administration has cleared. You know, of course, we who we have held unfairly, the backing down from both those decisions has continued Guantanamo. Open it up to anybody in the audience who has a question. If you could uh, just uh, mention your name, wait for the mic, uh, which is going to come to you right now. So take you the first question. This gentleman here with the glasses. My name is Mike Sponder. I was, uh, I'm from the outside, so they made me Director of Innovations at the Office of Naval Research. Forget about goodness and mercy. I'm, I'm talking to the choir who I all agree with. Assume for the sake of argument that every single one of these people went back. And I wish there was somebody on the other side. Instead of 15,970 AQAP or Al Qaeda or ISIS or everything, there'll be 15,000 and then 160. I'm not, forget about whether they're innocent or not. What's the difference if these people go back and they start off, especially if you go to Yemen? In Yemen, they keep getting killed. I'm not, and you're talking, the choir, I listen to the choir, except for the fact is, who cares if they go back? Okay. Bluntly, uh, now, if there were 68 people going back and there was nobody else out there, okay, I can understand that. But there's dozens of thousands of people fighting. Can anybody on the other side, by the way, not here, explain why? Just let them go. Well, l l let me say that I, I, I agree with you, except if you really have a Hala Sheikh Mohammed, you don't want to, you want to try him. I mean, aside, f and, and that's, that's, but you're right. Aside from guys who really could be leaders and bad, you create more people by keeping them here as a, I, so I agree. And, but they're not, but a lot of them are innocent. But go on, okay. Mo, Andy. 
Well, you know, there's, uh, there's been a lot of exaggeration and hysteria about this that has been stoked repeatedly throughout the, the media, throughout the establishment. Um, I think there have been, I think there is evidence that the number of people who have been released from Guantanamo who have engaged in anything that could be described as terrorism is very small, that it's much, much smaller than the figures that are, that are regularly banded about. Um, the latest, you know, the media tends to put together both the people that the establishment says are, are confirmed and suspected of re-engagement or engagement. Um, that, that, that you shouldn't put the two together. The suspected ones are, uh, you know, let's put those aside. Don't start saying those are official figures. You've got a 16% figure. I think that I think Peter and the research that's done here has, has said it's more like six. Um, and we, we, we just don't have this backed up properly. If it was investigated properly, we'd find that the, the Well, let me, ask, let me ask a question because this is relevant. So, because most of the people who re-engaged or whatever the term you want to use, or the Bush administration released a lot more people than the Obama administration. Yeah. And many of them were Saudis. And in fact, the two leaders of Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula are Saudi and they're both Guantanamo releasees. So, so the question is, now that there was this much, Matt Olson led the process where they looked at all the cases and the, the releases that have been happening now, do we, have a, do we have any sense? I mean, my, my intuition is, is a, the, the, that of those, almost nobody has gone over. Cliff Sloan said, of those, yeah. the, the percentage, and it's a fairly broad definition, re-engaging, uh, yeah. is 6.5%. Is okay, well. But see, you know, the, see, most Americans, this is the thing, it's like most, for, for most Americans, if it's anything above 0%, you know, th even though we know that in our own system, what in the federal court system, 66 people reoffend. Well, there you go. And this is, right. the, this is the exaggeration and hysteria, frankly, because if you've got a 60 to 70 percent recidivism rate within the domestic prison system and people want it to be zero in Guantanamo, forgetting, you know, all of the different angles of, you know, whether people engage or re-engage, how, how some people are frankly going to be very upset about the things that have happened to them. But the fact is, <laughs> The illusion that is created is that if you release a, you know, a single recidivist from Guantanamo, what it means is a guy who's going to be getting into a jumbo jet and trying to fly it into a tall building. You know, these are not people who are being recommended for release. It's, it, on every layer, there's hysteria and exaggeration because the genuinely dangerous people, the handful of people accused of being genuinely dangerous, are not going to be released under any circumstances like this. So you're talking about people who were essentially at best, low-level foot soldiers serving with the Taliban against the Northern Alliance in, in Afghanistan. And we come back to the whole problem with the war on terror, which is that the Bush administration said to the American people, these are the worst of the worst. Trust us, they're all terrorists. You know, when a, when a Kuwaiti guy that Tom talked about, called Fawzi al oda was released from Guantanamo in the fall, uh, um, he had his periodic review board recommend him for release. The BBC News website ran, uh, the headline for the story was, Terror Suspect Released to Q8. I have a friend who works for the BBC website. I, rang, I, I got in touch with him and I said, look, he was accused of training on a rifle in a camp in Pakistan one afternoon. He has never, never actually been accused of terrorism at all. And my friend went, you're absolutely right, Andy, I'll change it. But that's the casual nature of what happened after 9-11 with the war on terror is that foot soldiers in Afghanistan were turned into terrorists by the Bush administration. And it's a huge part of the problem that has existed ever since. We are unable to differentiate between foot soldiers and terrorists let me ask and you, civilians. Let me ask you a question. So the five Taliban leaders who were exchanged for um, Private Bo Bogdol, who went, to, who went to Qatar, do we know what's happened to them? Are they, are they under house arrest in Qatar? Have they done anything? As I understand it, they have done nothing. They're not under house arrest. Yeah. Can I say, you, of course, yeah. as you pointed out, uh, you know, they, and the military had said this, they would probably have needed to be in rele released soon anyway with the end of the war. So right. we basically gave them back and got Bergdahl. Yeah. And, and my, my understanding, though, is that they are not accused of having done anything since. We haven't heard anything about them, so I'm presuming. And my understanding yeah. of them, these are the guys who are, uh, you know, they were cabinet ministers. I mean, they were. Yeah. Well, they're also, you know, they're in their fifties or even perhaps yeah. in their sixties. I think they're Nothing happily. Matter with I think that. they're happily retired. In gutter. Uh, you know, <laughs> and, and and enjoying swanning around in you know in in Qatar and, and not being back in Afghanistan. In, but uh, you I was know. on Chris Matthews' show the day that the transfer was announced, and he ripped me a new one for you know how could President Obama send these you know bloodthirsty you know guys back out to 
you know, kill more Americans. And I'm like, more Americans? Right. You know, where's the evidence they ever did anything? You know, my job as chief prosecutor of the 779 only saw the cases of the ones where we felt that there was a determination there was potentially evidence that would warrant prosecution. So of the 779, there were roughly 75 that we'd identified as potential cases for prosecution, so less than 10%. When I saw the five, you know, when the, the, the announcement came out, these five people were being traded, and I looked at the list and I said, who in the hell are these guys? Hmm. I mean, they didn't even have enough evidence to even make it to my desk to be hmm. considered for prosecution, yet they're labeled, you know, as being these bloodthirsty terrorists that are going to go back and kill more Americans when they never... Well, it's a very, very valid point, Mo, actually, that, you know, that, 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 I mean, a couple of those guys were accused of atrocities in Afghanistan, which had never been confirmed as such, but... Um, it was part of the inter-Afghanistan, -Af you know, civil war. Um, mm. But the point... They, they are, none of them were ever accused of... of but that's, uh, it's really the point this America. gentleman made. You know, unless you get a very bad guy. Okay, so we're going to... No, 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 that's your point, except for a guy like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Yeah. That is your point. Um, Anne Speckard from Georgetown University. I worked on the detainee rehabilitation program where we had 20,000 detainees, 800 juveniles. And uh, just as you said, so many were picked up that, you know, just in a sweep, um, probably completely innocent, held for a very long time. I was able to, able to make interviews of them, also Palestinians, Kashmiris, that were held under so-called open check you know, without a, without a um, clear accusation and clear court process. And I would just like to confirm a lot of what you're saying. I mean, this in itself is psychological torture, to be held in a prison cell having no idea what your future is. Right, right, right Just to explain, so you, were, you went to Guantanamo. You, I, let me, I didn't quite get I what I didn't work in Guantanamo. I worked in 2006 putting together the detainee rehabilitation program in Iraq okay. for our 20,000 detainees, 800 juveniles. So it was an Islamic challenge and psychological program. And a lot of our detainees, um, in, in Iraq at least, were beaten badly when they were arrested. Uh, some of them had so-called soft torture in the prison, the high value ones. Um, less were tortured except for Abu Ghraib. And, um, but what I found in talking with these people is, okay, that was awful, but the ones that had been in Iraqi hands were very happy to come into our hands because mm -hmm. we don't torture the same. But you know, being put in a prison cell and having no idea of your future is torture in itself. And that's something that we don't think about. You know, anybody should go lock themselves in the closet for 20 minutes, see how they feel about it. And imagine, what is it, 13 years? You know, can, can I mention that, and I, and I normally make that point, that we concentrate on physical torture. Mm -hmm. It's a much worse torture to be, to be kept someplace uh, without cause and without having a hearing forever. There was one of our guys, uh, this, uh, not Fauzi al Oda, but Fayez al Khandri is still there, who said to me, I said, did they, you know, did they torture you? Did you describe these things? And he said to me, you know, that's over. I can take that. What I can't take is sitting here without reason forever, without a chance to get out. And I can confirm for you that I've talked to people that have gotten out, uh, Palestinians, for example, and they told me, they have PTSD. I'm a psychologist. I can diagnose it. They have PTSD. They're having flashbacks. They're so afraid. Could I get picked up again? Could this happen to me again? I mean, it's going to be with them for their entire lives of being put in a small cell. And also people told me, I will die before I'll get imprisoned again. You know, I'll do anything mm -hmm. before I'll get imprisoned again. So we have to keep in mind, this is an effect. It's, it's, it is torture in itself. Lady behind uh, uh, that's, um, I mean, uh, if I could just say something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I was talking, I didn't, I didn't, you know, go into the torture report. And one of the things that has concerned me about the torture report, apart from the, you know, clear lack of accountability, which, which I think we, it is necessary for us to pursue, is that it was dealing with the CIA program, and that it was possible for people not to recognise that actually the whole post 9/11 response, the whole war on terror, um, has torture built into it at all kinds of levels. And that one of those levels is at Guantanamo, where there was a specific, for a very short amount of time, there was a CIA black site within uh, Guantanamo. But, but the, the system at Guantanamo itself um, has involved torture. Um, a, a program that Donald Rumsfeld introduced, which spread amongst the prison population in 2002 to 2004, is one thing. Um, looking at the whole history of Guantanamo, 
one of the things is the um, is the force feeding of hunger strikers, which you know, which is clearly, according to medical experts, is abusive and could rise to the level of torture. That's something that's ongoing. Um, I saw the latest account from Shaka Armour in Guantanamo, who was saying that a Pakistani guy who's still held, who has been on a hunger strike for a long time, weighs 92 pounds. And you know, we don't see the pictures of these people because it would shock us to the core to see people who look like concentration camp survivors. But the other thing is the low level, I shouldn't call it low level even, that makes it sound insignificant, is the torture that's built into an arbitrary indefinite detention program like Guantanamo. And the quote that I have that, that, that has a, a strong resonance is from a man who was a representative of the International Committee of the Red Cross called Christophe Giro, who spoke in October 2003. You know, the Red Cross people aren't supposed to talk about the prisons they visit because they get access to difficult prisons on the basis that they don't talk about it. But the Red Cross repeatedly did speak publicly about Guantanamo because they were so shocked. And this man on this occasion, October 2003, said, we are concerned about the mental health effects of, of indefinite attention on the men held at Guantanamo. That was over 11 years ago. So that doesn't get any better the longer it goes on. And that, that's exactly you know, the point that people need to know, is that, is that there are men at Guantanamo who wake up every day, and, uh, you know, and that's the first thing that they think about, that, that that's all they're living with will I ever be released from this place? And that's what's wrong. Not just that these men were never charged with a crime and, co and convicted, which is what you need, but also that, that, if, that they weren't held as prisoners of war who would understand that there could be an end to, to the conflict um, in connection with which they were detained. And we, you know, we've, we've mentioned the end of hostilities, but we've never really been able to talk about how people at Guantanamo, for the most part, are soldiers who have not been detained as soldiers, that they have been deprived, still, they continue to be deprived of their rights. Well, most of them aren't even soldiers. No. Yeah. Well, that's so. one, to me one of the great fallacies, because you hear like Lindsey Graham, I know a couple of times has talked about, or not just Lindsey Graham, others, about the battlefield. You know, you can't have Private Smith having to stop in the middle of an armed conflict on the battlefield and do a Miranda rights, which makes eminent sense. I mean, you can't argue with that, but it's, I can think of, the only person I can think of that even comes close to that description is Omar Cotter, right. who was actually captured in a firefight. I mean, if you take the high-value detainees, for instance, like the five 9-11 cases, none of them, there was no, Private Smith didn't capture KSM. <laughs> All these guys were apprehended by intelligence services in other countries, nowhere near the battlefield, and turned over. Yeah, yeah, and so this whole notion about, you know, we've got to have Guantanamo and military confinement and military commissions because, you know, this, we're at war is just a false premise, in, except in just, I, I think you, you could count on your fingers the number of people that were actually captured on the battlefield in the sense that most people would think of that. And the other, I think another great fallacy or tragedy is I mentioned there are six people that have actually been convicted of war crimes, you know, convicted war criminals. Four of the six, like uh, for instance, David Hicks is back home in Australia. Four of the six aren't at Guantanamo. So your best chance of getting out of Guantanamo is to be convicted as a war criminal because you've got a four and six chance of going home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and if you're never charged, you could spend the rest of your life there. <laughs> well, so in fact, some of the real nobodies in Guantanamo have complained about that, that, they, you know, that they've been approached to say, is there anything that you can say to us so that we can put you on trial and you can have a plea deal? And they've gone, no, because I know nothing. You know, um, I mean, what a topsy-turvy <laughs> world that is. This lady here. Oh, hi. I just wanted to, uh, I'm Heather Brandon from Human Rights First. Um, I just wanted to add, I know we were talking before about when, I think uh, Colonel Davis, about when the um, KSM trial might actually start and you predicted 2016 in federal court, which um, is better than um, what some of the defense attorneys are predicting. I was just down there as an observer for a hearing that never happened mm -hmm. for the KSM trial and the defense attorneys were saying 2018 in military commissions at the earliest. Yeah. Um, oh, did you want to? Oh, you saw as well recently, they've now, the judges are now being held hostage. <laughs> yes. As if the military commissions weren't tainted enough, now to improve the optics, the judges are being held hostage. Their only duty, I mean, they're, you know, they're stationed at Guantanamo now. Not, I mean, used to, they would travel down, you know, as necessary, they'd have hearings. 
Now they're stationed at Guantanamo, they have no other duties, and they're there until the trials are completed. No. So that really, you know, enhances the <laughs> optics that we're holding the judges hostage at Guantanamo. Um, yeah, the other question that I did have was about what we were just talking about then, about the end of the armed conflict, which would trigger this release of the indefinite slash law of war detainees. Because the administration says that they're in an armed conflict with Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and associated forces. And because of that associated forces term, that now captures the conflict in Yemen, you know, against uh, Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula. Now they've, they've sort of shoehorned ISIS into that. Are you sort of worried that, you know, they will give this as a reason for never releasing these people at Guantanamo, even though the Afghanistan war is over? And do you think a Supreme Court decision will be the trigger that eventually, you know... Let, 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 yeah. me, let, let me address that a bit. Uh, that is an issue which really hasn't been faced yet. And, there's, and honestly, there's an argument that could be made that the conflict in Afghanistan is not over even if the war is because we're still there. The defining standard on this is really by Justice O'Connor in the Hamdi case, when she didn't say it explicitly, but made it pretty clear that our justification for holding people absent charge and trial is only in this law of war, is under the laws of war, and it's only for holding somebody picked up in a particular armed conflict till the end of that particular armed conflict. That's the way Hamdi reads. It hasn't been challenged yet, but that's really the defining standard on it. Um, and um, that has been, you know, the uh, holding until the end of the conflict has been the primary justification for holding most of these people. It's been blurred and everything, as Andy said, but that will be the next question. Well, I, honestly, let me ask you a question, Dr. Thomas. So, so because we are not in a conflict, an armed conflict with the Taliban now, as of December 31st. Are there anybody, is there anybody from the Taliban still, or, or, in, or any Afghans still in the prison? Um, there are a handful of Afghans in the prison, but all the high level ones went to Qatar, so they're, no. they're very low level. And but but theoretically, the, they could be freed mm -hmm. on that basis. But the, I suppose, yeah. No, but, the, but the right to, it wouldn't only apply to the Afghans, of course. It would be anyone else who was a, allegedly picked up because of the continuation of that war. And there is an argument that the administration could make that we now, even though the war has ended, we are involved with advisors down there as the war restarts with the Taliban. Whether the administration makes that argument be very interesting because if they want to get rid of people they could say no but the administration throughout has made very aggressive arguments to keep people in guantanamo for instance they could have consented to a number of habeas petitions and then really avoided all the con congressional restrictions on moving people but they never did well, why this sort of schizophrenia because on the one hand you have people like dan freed and clifford sloan who seem to be made they made quite a good effort to get people out and, and what's the what, well, why, what's the schizophrenia? Peter, I think that is one of the great questions that not, has not been examined about this administration. While President Obama makes great statements, I want to close Guantanamo, I want to do it, in fact he has the authority to close it right away by transferring people out and he hasn't done it. Now he's waited for an, a, a midterm election, he's done something. The Justice Department under his and Eric Holder's watch has been very aggressive about making arguments to keep people there. Let me just give you an example. After we won so that these people have the right to habeas corpus, um, the DC Circuit, which you called it one of the most respected, it's certainly one of the most conservative um, courts, took the view that if the government presented any evidence, it would be accepted as true in a habeas hearing. That's very unusual. It's, not, it's contrary to English habeas. <laughs> because you, so any evidence presented by the government was accepted as true, even if it was a hearsay allegation from somebody else. As a result, it stopped people from getting out. That was a, a position that the Justice Department advocated, very aggressive 
uh, position. Why do they do that? If they is want to close the part of the Justice Department, that was—I mean—is it the National Security Division or who, who, who's? When you say it's the a Justice division Department, division within the Criminal Division that's handled the Guantanamo cases, and yeah. they've taken very aggressive litigation positions. Pretty it hasn't been examined. Obama, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, are they the same people essentially? I mean, are they yeah, a lot of them are the same people. Yeah. yeah. Same people as before. Well, yeah. meaning across administrations. I mean, yeah. well, except except yes, but you have that new appointments in in charge. Of right. Them. And I, you know, um, they could have really simply consented to certain habeas petitions, and, and they would be all being inv interviewed by Tim Golden, who was a fellow here, who's doing yes. this big book on Guantanamo. Do you know, do you know when that's coming? I think it's. Yeah. I haven't. Yeah. <laughs> um, he can talk to me. In fact. Uh, Brian Beery, Washington correspondent for Europolitics. I'm um, just wondering among the European countries, because there was a time when a lot of them were pressuring the US, who's left at this point that is still sort of trying actively to close the detention center by offering to take prisoners or trying to find solutions? And do you think that the Paris attacks um, are going to change the mood in Europe and that that momentum may slow in the coming months? Um, the only... I mean, men were released recently to Slovakia, um, and as I say, I've heard that Estonia is interested in taking at least one mm. prisoner. Um, you know, we don't have a public a account of which countries are being spoken to and, and, and what's likely. <coughs> um, a lot of European countries that were willing already did take in um, prisoners in the early years before Congress imposed restrictions. Maybe there are others uh, um, on the horizon. For the Paris thing, I would very much hope that people don't make the kind of um, connections that are, that are unacceptable. Um, because if you make connections between what happened in Paris and men approved for release from Guantanamo, the only basis on which you can do that is that both people that we're talking about are Muslims. Um, and there is, you know, there is no line that can be drawn between terrorists attacking people in Paris and people held in Guantanamo approved for release, except that they're all Muslims. So, you know, I would very much hope that, that that's not the case. I'm glad to say that I haven't seen any, I haven't seen much of that happening in, in general over, over the years. As Let the, me ask as you a factual question about this Congress. So the restrictions that Congress have put on, it, it, it's about the, f it's, it, it, it relate to the funding for people who might be transferred. Yes. They won't pay for flights. Well, so they so won't pay for, for funding for the Defense Department. It, it's, Jim Moran can explain it better, but it, it's, there is no funding if you do these things. But, where so, so, but people are being transferred, so the government's like the, S the, the Slovakian me. government is paying for the transfer? Or no, 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 excuse me. They are being fund those transfers which comply with the regulations, they, the government pays for the transfers. <laughs> so, and this has been so for, for years. Carl Levin put something in the bill. There was something restricting transfers to the United States. That okay. really hasn't been changed. Then there was a, a restriction on transfers to other countries unless the Secretary of Defense would personally certify that the person transferred would never do anything bad. Mm. Jay Johnson, who was general counsel at the time, said nobody can transfer that. Nobody can do that. Nobody can Car guarantee that. Nobody can guarantee that. So Carl Levin put something in the law which said, okay, you don't need to guarantee it. But if you can't guarantee it, could you just say that the transfer is in the national interest and that the receiving country has taken reasonable steps to mitigate the risk. That's hmm. been in the law for six, five or six years. So all Obama needs to do, our secretary, is saying the receiving country has taken reasonable steps to mitigate it. He's had that authority for five or six years. So, so th those who are transferred qualify and therefore get funding. Peter, can I yeah. just say one thing? I am very afraid of the Paris, what the Paris attacks will mean. Um, and I, you know, you don't talk to people <laughs> who say this, but I think what we've operated in for the last 13 years is a fear environment. I mean, when I first started this 12 years ago, I'll never forget being at a dinner with young law professors, husband and wife, and I said, why aren't you up in arms about this? It's so against our legal traditions that you hold people without trial and throw them away this way. And they said, I know you're right, he said, but we've got young children and we're afraid. Can, can you imagine that? I, I know people after the Paris attacks who say, who have said to me, well, maybe we need to loosen our rules on torture. Maybe we need to loosen our rules on detention. 
I think it feeds to that, and I'm very afraid of it. You know, I, a counter-argument to that is I was sort of surprised. You can, you can only tell if a society is resilient after an event. Obviously, you don't want events, but you can't run the experiment with an actual an event. And I thought the Boston Marathon bombings, kind of surprised by, like pleasantly surprised, that Americans sort of seem to take that in stride. They didn't say, hey, we, we, you know, there's been no calls to send, no one said, hey, we should send Jahar Sanyev to Gitmo, as far as I can tell. He's going to be a, it seemed, I mean, I don't know if, if you felt the same way. It seemed like a somewhat mature response. These were two kind of no hopers. I think was. So I think it's unfortunate, though, because like you know, Tom mentioned, if you look at the, the, like when Bush was in office, a majority of Americans were opposed to torture. And that line is skewed the other way now to where a majority of Americans say that torture. Can I throw out an idea about this issue? Uh, two yeah, ideas. Please. I mean, first of all, I think people watch too many movies. And I think that is kind of explains a lot of what happened. Um, and I'm serious about that. I right? agree. And secondly, if you look at the people who made these decisions, they had, they had two things in common. None of them were federal prosecutors or defense attorneys or, F or FBI agents. And none of them had any experience in any of this. They just had no knowledge. And there's a huge, as you, if you'd alluded to, we have like a huge amount of scientific data about effective, eliciting eff information effectively, yeah, yeah. right? There's a lot, I mean, this is not, and this is all well known. In fact, it was well known to the CIA. Again, this is in the report, yeah. right? Because the they, they did their own, they were, well, was, you know, we, of course it was known to the FBI, but also it was known to the CIA. It was in the CIA report. It was, you know, CIA looked into this question in the, in the 70s or 80s. So and it, anyway, it was, it seemed to be based on sort of uh, a very childish kind of understanding of. But, but why is it gained acceptance? Is is I most that's most. I think we've got because I, I I know I've yeah. got a daughter who's 25 and most of my students are about 25 and I, yeah. if you think about it, their whole adult life, has been post 9/11. They don't remember 9/10. They remember 9/11 right. forward. Where I, mean, I, was, I mentioned the other day when I was traveling, I got pulled aside and. And it used to, if you got felt up at the airport, it was called sexual assault, not pre-boarding. <laughs> but it's, it's I think you've used that line before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's become the new normal. You know, it's become the normal that we Well, expect. that's a very interesting question, which is about how, you know, one thing that you never hear in the budget discussions in Washington is sort of, you know, we have this huge counterterrorism apparatus. I mean, the intelligent budget tripled since 9-11. You don't hear any discussion of sort of, it's almost impossible. I mean, as a political matter, you're not going to hear Hillary Clinton or Jeb Bush say, hey, we've really managed this terrorism problem, which is true. I mean, 25 Americans have died in jihadi terrorist attacks since 9-11. You know, if you're using even a generous, you know, that, we, that we're on top of this. No one's going to say that. I mean, President Obama did, to his credit, sort of gesture in this direction with his speech at NDU on May, I think it was May 2013. Yeah. Uh, but as a political matter, it's impossible if you ha want a career in this country to say, this is really a problem that we've sort of managed. I'd admit perhaps there are, I mean, I'd, do you hear sort of, you know, leading politicians making this argument? But Peter, how do you explain what, what Mo said? I'm, I'm troubled that the majority of Americans condone torture now. I, no, that's well, I, I, it's troubling, but let me, uh, let me just throw this out as an idea. I mean, polling kind of, it sort of, to, you know, it can, that kind of number can change over time. I mean, are you seeing it as a sort of consistent trend in this direction? Yes. Yeah. And maybe it is through television shows like 24 and that movie that had the people. Um, Zero Doc. Yeah. Sir, you know, I must say that I, I, you know, I know George Bush. I went to school with him. And he thought torture worked. I know the way his mind. He saw 24 and said, this is proof to him. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> it has that sort of. Uh, I don't think it's just, I mean, if you look at like, gu like gun control, you know, the numbers there are flip flop. I think the country as a whole is just bought into this fear, state of fear, that we've got to protect ourselves and any means necessary and just keep us safe. Well, I mean, I psychologists, I mean, Anne is a, you're a psychiatrist or a psychologist? Psychologist. Or psycho I mean, so, well, I mean, there's a huge amount of sort of scientific evidence about this. I mean, uh, you know, our, our sort of reptilian brain is very kind of, you know, kind of takes over in, in moments of uh, kind of national crisis. And well, which is why, you know, Article 2.2 2 of the UN Convention Against Torture says, you know, there are no circumstances in which right. your reptilian brain is allowed to take over. <laughs> <laughs> it is an right. absolute prohibition. I right. mean, the, the, the problem with what's happened, I think, is that, you know, it is essentially that no one has been held accountable. Um, so although people can say they, they, uh, they object to the use of torture, the case hasn't properly been made. Well, About its ineffectiveness, I mean, this is the perfect time. The, uh, the executive summary of the torture report really show, lays bare the, um, the, the cruel pointlessness of it all. Cruel that, it was, yeah. that it was so wrong Unethical on every level. And unefficacious. Um, but also because people yeah. who, who, who 
initiated it that nobody has actually been held accountable. It well, really me, does me, help me, to, me throw to suggest one, to people that it's Anne, okay. One quick question. I mean, the court of public opinion is a pretty powerful one. It's just as, I mean, court of law is obviously even more powerful. I mean, the report getting published and naming names, I think, I think it, it was That's helpful. Yeah, it yeah, was, yeah, definitely. Uh, and, you know, Feinstein's going to introduce this bill, basically making this sort Good of... for her. Yeah, yeah. I'd just like to add to this. This is a great discussion, and something the American people have not heard is about cases where people were tortured and then volunteered to be suicide bombers, or when they were tortured and they can never get over it, and uh, or the relatives go to groups because the relatives were tortured mm -hmm. and say, I volunteer now. And that's the kind of things we need to put out in the press so people understand, number one, it's not effective. You don't get good results from torturing people. And number two, it feeds terrorism recruitment. Yep. And those messages I don't see getting out into the public. And we've got data on it, including my own. Well, I agree, and I'd like to work with you on that. The problem is, I'll tell you, I mean, I remember years ago, I could get interviewed and put editorials in the Times, the Post, the other. Now, nobody cares. About you, Guantanamo. Yeah, or, or these things. Even, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll interview Diane Feinstein and then somebody on the other side saying she hasn't done it. But people won't go to the substance of stories. I mean, even if we try, I'm a little disappointed by the media and these things because these are important facts to get out. So. Hi, my name is Scott Cooper. I'm uh, at Human Rights First as well. I I'd like to take you to task um, on, because we, I think, in this room are all in agreement. Um, how do we then convince those that want to close Guantanamo that, you know, we have the chairman of the Joint Chiefs that says uh, it should be closed, it's international interest. Almost any military officer you talk to, and as a former military officer myself, you know, I, I spend a lot of time on this. So how do we convince, for instance, and, and, and I think it's probably true to say the Republican side, the Mitch McConnells, the Senator Ayats, the, um, the Lindsey Grahams, that this makes a great deal of sense. Not the 59 cleared for release, because that's all within our power, as well as speeding up the PRB process. Absolutely within our power. But again, changing the court of public opinion, um, I, I scratch my head about it every day. So I, I'd love to hear what ideas you have along those lines. I think I think the administration has just done a terrible job of letting the public be misled. Because <laughs> I think the public is bought into the worst of the worst and just kind of out of sight and out of mind. I would, like with Lindsey Graham, and he brings up the, you know, captured on the battlefield and Sergeant Smith can't do Miranda rights and that kind of, which is just a false, I mean, it's, it's a true statement, but totally irrelevant to Guantanamo. So I think what would be helpful if you actually had like a substantive discussion, I mean, I've asked this on the other side, I mean, I could tick off all the, you know, the expense, the damage to our reputation, the effectiveness of federal courts, all the reasons why there is no, you know, Guantanamo makes no sense whatsoever. What are the points, other than just political talking points that the president's so, you know, weak on terrorism? Put that aside. What are the concrete points that say, that support Guantanamo? And I don't, I'm not aware of any. I haven't heard anyone give one valid point for why Guantanamo makes sense. And I think that's where you could sway the public, is that if they had an honest discussion and not just the political talking points. You need to have the forum. You need to get it out. The only person writing about Guantanamo today is Andy Worthington. I'm serious. You know, the public has put it aside. Mm -hmm. It's 130 Muslim men at a time of thing of people Carol we care Carol Rosenberg about. at the Miami Herald. She does. Yeah. She does. Well, we have an issue. We have, an, we have an issue with people not wanting to listen, which I think is very difficult, because when the, when the executive summary of the torture report came out, it's absolutely clear that that destroys the rationale for torture on every single basis. What happened? A whole bunch of people sprang up just ignoring it, ignoring it, saying torture worked when the, when, you know, the executive summary explicitly says, no, it didn't. On every level, what was done didn't work. Uh, so it's, it, you know, how we actually deal with those issues, I think, is very difficult. I'd love to see President Obama make statements as eloquently about the, about, about the wrongness of torture as he has about Guantanamo. But on Guantanamo, again, the, the people who don't want to listen haven't listened. When he explains publicly why it's so wrong, that's everything that you need to hear. But the supporters and those, those Republican le leaders that you were talking about, they're never going to be swayed. They have the, the, those notions that they're wedded to, you know, they drive them. 
Well, I, I don't know. In, in the torture report, remember, it came off as partisan. The only Republican who supported it was John McCain. And, you know, I, my hat's off to him. He did it. I, um, so we need to do better work. Actually, we're going to wind this up uh, because uh, we're almost at, out of time. Um, Andy's book is for sale. Uh, I'm sure the gentlemen here will entertain questions. Uh, and uh, we should all thank them for their work and thank for their you. service uh, to the nation. Thank you. Thank you.